What's happening? Hello. Well, let me change this background off. There you are. How are Hello. you? Sitting here having a nice slice of pepperoni pizza. How about yourself? I did something different today. I went a little risky. Um, you know, in mm. honor of National Sport and PE Week, I tweeted out just earlier this week how sports uh, really got me out of my comfort zone and helped me take risks. So I took the risk of getting a chicken Alfredo pizza. So let me try it for the first time. And you know, I love just my pepperoni and cheese pizza, red sauce. So this is my first kind of like chicken Alfredo white sauce type of pizza. Are you trying to run a 5K, a Thunder Mifflin 5K with some chicken Alfredo? <laughs> well, you Michael Scott. I heard you got a carb up beforehand. <laughs> mm. It's okay, but I like the I like the pepperoni. I'm a traditionalist on that. Speaking of 5K, in honor of National Sport and PE Week, too, I tweeted out, and I don't like to brag on myself. I'm humble, but you saw where I got into the Boston Marathon it's for amazing. October 11th. You are absolutely my hero. I can't run that fast. Yes, you can. I can run that far, not that fast. Yeah, you run further than me in your ultra marathon. So I'm just excited that um, – Boston will come alive again with that Boston Marathon to take place October 11th, which usually is in April on Patriots Day, but because of the COVID-19. So I'm just happy. I mean, it's going to be epic. I can't wait. And the weather's going to be is always awesome that time of year up in New England. Oh, I know. The fall foliage, and it's going to be beautiful. Okay, let's get to our guest because... Um, we've been wanting to have him on, and we knew when we created this Pizza and PE podcast that he was one of the ones that were like, we're going to get him on. He has Absolutely. influenced our careers dramatically. Like we would not be where we are without his influence and his connections and his expertise and wisdom. So who do we have, Keith? So today we have Artie Kamiya. Uh, he has been called the nation's leading expert for K-12 physical education. Always in demand for his exciting presentations. Artie has conducted about 500 workshops in over 40 different states. He is the co-owner of a well-known publishing consulting firm and has successfully written over $45 million in grants for schools. His mm -hmm. work has appeared on numerous ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox TV affiliates, as well as on national public radio and in the USA Today. A former National Physical Education Administrator of the Year, 2004, he was recognized by the National Association for Sport and Physical Education as the 2007 Joy of Effort Award winner. Distinguished as one of the most enthusiastic and compelling physical education professionals, he has a standing offer to present at numerous state and national conferences throughout the year. He and his family live in Durham, North Carolina. Well, I mean, that's a lot. And I, to be honest with you, that's probably not enough. There's probably a whole lot more that we can put on there for Artie. So who's our guest, Keith? Artie Kamiya. Because I think you gave his bio, but you didn't give his guest. Yeah, the fact that he's in our home state is, 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 we're just so proud that we are able to have him in our home state and the influence that he's done in North Carolina and across the globe for PE. Oh, I got well, goosebumps when you were saying that, to be honest with you. You can't go to any conference in the state without seeing Artie, whether he's speaking or putting it together or getting people together. His hands are in it somehow. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Pizza fun fact, Keith. What we got? All right. So your pizza fun fact. This one's a pretty cool one. I searched a little bit for this one. But in the late 1960s, the U.S. Army's 113th Military Intelligence Unit spied on reporters and politicians using fake pizza deliveries. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> right? Isn't it? Oh, here's your pizza. We didn't order pizza. That's all right. <laughs> Have a decoy. I love it. Uh -huh. Wow. So pizza was used to spy. How great is that? Mm. So I have a little confession to make. Oh, boy. I asked my own kids, who I have an 18-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I said, you know, what do you think about this podcast? Give me some tips. Because, you know, they're all into the social media and, you know, social media influencers. And when my son heard the podcast, he goes, Mom, you're a little cringy. I go, what do you mean cringy? He goes, well, you're too enthusiastic. You're too, like, energetic. He goes, you got to chill. I go, I can't. I can't calm that down. 
And every time we do a podcast, I think I'm going to calm that energy down. It's just not going to happen, viewers. It's You're going to get who I am because even when Keith was explaining about our guest bio, I was getting so excited and just a little teary-eyed about how much he's impacted this PE community and health, health community across the globe. So I each week I'm tasked with, okay, what does this guest bring? What is this guest's big niche, big theme? And right. all I kept thinking about is how Artie connects people with people. He's a networker, he's a connector. So I Google search, like what does connector mean? Is that even a term? And it is. So before I bring Artie to the, to the broadcast, um, this is what, Google came up with what a connector is. A connector is relationship focused. Yep, that's already. Acts and gets results with ease because they have a level of credibility and trust in and from their network. A level of trust. That's already. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the connector personality is considerate, cooperative, and encouraging. Check, 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 Artie. And connectors seek harmony and personal connection. Let's bring them on, Artie Kamiya. Hey. Hello. There he is. Hey, human key. Oh, my goodness. Good Artie, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. This is so exciting. Um, I think you were, you were able to hear us before you came on, but... I'm not going to be able to tone down my energy when you're on this broadcast. So I'm just geeked out that you're here and you're taking the time off on your vacation <laughs> where you're surrounded by all these PE gurus, which of course those are your friends, your PE friends. Um, so let's get started. Um, I know that you're well known around our PE community, our health community. Like I stated in our introduction, is you are the ultimate connector. Will you share with us like how you got started in your teaching career? Just sure. maybe some people don't know like your your original start. <laughs> What's your background? How did you get started? So um, I originally started as an elementary physical education teacher, teaching at three different schools, mm. and this was oh. in 1978. 78. That was. That was a long time ago uh, mm -hmm. in Wake County uh, public school system in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I saw approximately 840 uh, K-5 students one day a week for 30 minutes. Okay. I had uh, uh, a school that I taught at Monday, Tuesday, the Wednesday morning, then moved to another school Wednesday afternoon, all, noon, all day Thursday. And then an, another school, three schools, and I saw that school on Friday. So I'm a, that's my, I'm a grassroots elementary physical education teacher. That was my start, Kim. Wow. So then you were located at schools probably based on the number of students per school, because it sounds like your Wednesday school might have been really small, right. that you were able to right. service those right. PE classes in half a day, pack your car up. Now, did you have to pack your car up with PE equipment before going on to your next school or did they yes. have equipment? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we had very little um, support, very little equipment. So in, in mm -hmm. order to have an instructional program and a lot of physical education teachers did that, you know, they, yeah. just, they, they, they purchased the biggest vehicle they could and they yep. loaded it up. If you didn't have equipment, you made it. That's right. You didn't have jump ropes. You found a way to make your jump ropes. PVC pipe. Uh, you would make balls out of uh, <laughs> pantyhose. pantyhose. Yes, I remember that. That was a workshop. <laughs> I think yeah. we put on a workshop with you and Jim Rich and Larry McDonald. Yeah, right. I mean, that was just how it was done. Uh, we really needed to have an instructional program. That's what we learned. That's how we instructed. That's the way that we did it. So it sounds like uh, since 1978, there hasn't been much change in the amount of funding that has gone toward no, the <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. Um, but I think we've gotten better and we've gotten smarter. And and really over time, we've been able to enlist the help of uh, PTA, PTOs, mm -hmm. uh, other, um, other parents within the community that had access to pieces of equipment. 
and things like that. So it's gotten a whole lot better. Yeah. And instructional time, um, maybe about the same in our state, about once a week. But we flipped the script too lately, you know, where right. it's not just solely the responsibility of a PE teacher to do the physical activity and movement. Right. Now, physical education has the skills and dispositions to teach that physical literacy, where movement and physical activity is separate, where classroom teachers now have flipped the script where they're doing more of that instead of just relying on PE teachers to say, just go run them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get them, get they, they got the wiggles, run them, please. And right. I remember. Yeah. But Artie, I worked at Rowan Salisbury Schools. That was my start. And I had one of those positions where Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, half a day, packed up my car and went to another school. So I know that routine. Sure. And I remember buying my first car and being on a first, second year teacher budget. I remember telling the car dealer saying, look, I can't have a two door car. I got to have at least a four door car that I can pack. Imagine 30 basketballs, please. Right. 30 playground balls, yarn balls. And I remember going down the road holding <laughs> bags of equipment down the road going, okay, <laughs> let's just get to the school down the road. <laughs> yeah. But the kids were so excited, weren't they? I mean, when your vehicle uh -huh. pulled into the parking yeah. lot, they and they saw that. I yeah. mean, they were just so excited. Because mm -hmm. yeah. most of the time they're outside for recess and they see you coming in. And I remember honking my horn and they're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing, you know, you think about this. Yeah. We, we talk, uh, Kim and I talk about this often. Um, it's like when you walk into a school, especially if you get there in the morning, right? Right, right as kids are coming in, right. you go to where the PE teacher is doing their morning duty. They, we used to get mobbed. Hey, high right. five, hugs and everything like that. And I, I, it scares me if you ever walk in and you see somebody not getting that. And you go, how are you not the rock star right now? No <laughs> relationship. Yeah, it's. It's pretty cool. It's I mean, we have to admit, it is pretty cool to be a physical education teacher. The wow. coolest. Oh, yeah. The yeah, coolest. The people thing. say like, you know, oh, it must be nice being able to wear those kind of clothes. And I'm like, there's so much purpose. I go, you could be a PE teacher. I'm just smarter. <laughs> the coolest job ever. I would redo yeah. my whole career over and over again. Well, and, when I was, I was in, that, in that stage of not knowing where I wanted to do something. Uh, when I was in college and I was like, you know, am I going to be a, a marine biologist? And I was like, yeah, it kind of turned me off the first teacher to it. But I was working a summer baseball camp and they gave me the youngest kids in the group. And I'm like, what do I do? But watching the light bulb go off as I'm teaching kids sports. Right. Right. I was like, I'm sold. I'm 100 percent in. This is awesome. Kids are awesome. Kids are awesome. Kids are awesome. And they're so they're funny. Mm -hmm. oh, they're absolutely funny. Uh, and they're so impressionable. Mm -hmm. And they're so trusting. And they're very fragile. That's one thing that beginning teachers really need to understand how sensitive and fragile these young and impressionable these young students are. Um, I'm so, writing it down. Yeah, it's, it, it takes a long time. It took me a long time to be that teacher that the students really needed. It took me three or four years mm -hmm. to really become the student that the teacher needed. It's, and, and I call it multifaceted. I was a two or three dimensional teacher. In other words, I, I wasn't able to switch my persona to match what the students needed at all times. Sure. You have to be multifaceted. You've got to be able to take a look at a student, take a look at a lesson, take a look at a certain situation. And whatever persona you're projecting at that time, find another way to connect, to make that connection with your students. And, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we're beginning teachers are just two or three dimensional. We really don't have what it really, really takes to make it work. Well, it does take a lot of, um, you know, your first three years, right? You learn so much in the first three years, and it depends on what kind of mentors you had going in. Right. Uh, I, I found, and and like you're saying, having to be multidimensional, the hard thing is, 
until you learn how to build those connections with your students, especially when you work in an elementary school with six, seven, eight hundred kids, right? Your dimension has to change for the class. That's you know, you just had a first grade class. You know, you have this kid, this kid, and this kid. So you have to be multifaceted there. And then you got fifth grade coming in right behind. So now sure. it's but yeah. it takes a hot minute to the really eight. to do right. that. You know? Yeah. And uh, beginning teachers, I mean, I was very, I, I, I hate to admit it, um, I was intimidated by those fifth grade students. I mean, they, they knew exactly what buttons to push. Yes. And a few of them did. Uh, but you have to give yourself a little bit of grace, a little bit of yeah. grace, a little bit of TLC and understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, not, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Still, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm still mm -hmm. making mistakes and learning. Uh, but you give it your best shot. You just give it your best shot. Well, you know, that, I, I think one of the hardest things, <laughs> this is going to be just real easy, is trying to hold a steady face when a kid says something that you know is inappropriate, <laughs> but it's funny as can be, and you're just trying to, like, hold it together without. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did many of these, like, turn away. It's being like. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's very interesting. You learn a lot about yourself. I mean, you know, just uh, I was a young educator. Uh, I was newly married. Um, became a father as well during that time, and there was a lot of growth. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of different experiences piling up one by one, one on top of another. Sure, it was tough. Well, you know, um, that kind of leads me the way you say this into into the next little question I have for you. And that's, you know, when we first get in, we're trying to make some connections. And when we first got to know you, it was through trainings that you did um, with Larry Mack and, and Jim Rich, especially myself in Union County. because that's where I got. Uh, I know Lindsay Jones brought you in several times. Sure. And yeah. um, so what was it like working with these guys in the DPI? And I, you know, how did you first meet? Was it working in DPI or was it teaching in the same district? So it, um, I was really fortunate to be, to be able to work with two master educators, mm -hmm. and that's Larry McDonald and Jim Rich. Mac mm -hmm. came to us, came to DPI. Uh, this is in 1983, uh, from an assistant principal ship in Jackson County, up in the mountains. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim Rich was an adapted physical education teacher in Wilmington, New Hanover County. Uh, Mac, for those of you that do not know Mac, the guy is, he's, he's very, uh, uh, what's a good word? Well, he's about six foot three. 250 pounds. It's a mountain always, man. Yeah, always uh, looking for ways to stretch you, to stretch yourself. Jim and Mac knew each other before I did. Here I am. I'm, you know, a young physical education teacher. Uh, I saw them. I saw the way they interacted with one another. It was phenomenal. The very first things we did, we went on the road doing all-day presentations. Mm -hmm. I've never done an all-day workshop by myself. And so there's the three of us doing these all-day workshops going everywhere. And then Mac had connections all across the United States. So soon we're doing workshops in other states, you know, Texas, West Virginia, New York, everywhere. We're doing workshops. So we grew as workshop presenters and we were very, very critical of ourselves. At the end of every one of those presentations, we sat down and we said, well, Artie, you, should, you could have done this better. Or Mac, you could have done, had you thought about doing this? And, and Jim, you talk too much. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. You got to give them more activities more quickly. You talk too much. Um, and so we learned to, uh, come up with a format, 20 minutes of activity, set them down, let them think, uh, talk about pedagogy for 20 minutes and back out on the floor with more activity. So it was like 20 on 20 off, 20 on 20 off. And that just went throughout the entire day because we wanted them to actually be reflective and think about what it was they were teaching and why were they teaching it? 
Sure. Um, yeah. It was I mean, terrific. That's a, good part. that's a good part of teaching. I mean, it, that's it's also the hard part is being reflective. I mean, we could, we could always be our worst, our own worst enemy. I mean, you know, we, we often talk. It's hard sometimes for me to hear myself on this podcast alone, let alone when yeah. I was teaching. You go back and you go, oh, man, I missed this. And that could have gone way better if I'd have just done this. But through those reflections, you learn. And it's good right. that you had two other guys, you know, that trio, you mm -hmm. know, to, to help you. Right. And then the other thing I, I want, I really want to mention because it, it really made a difference to this young educator is Mac had all the experience already. And he sat me down the very first thing he says, Artie, he was hired as the chief consultant. I was hired under him as the physical education consultant. We all both did K-12. But as the chief consultant, he had more. He, he was my boss. Uh, he sat me down and says, Artie, you don't work for me. You're going to work with me. That's different. When you have a boss that says, you do not work for me, we're going to work together that's a different perspective that doesn't happen very often i don't think um but that's something that i as i went through the career ranks wanted to bring to whatever situation i was responsible for all right that's so powerful yeah i've heard so many of what we call mac isms sure so there's, there's a lot there's a lot and um that you'd be amazed to have, like, you know, the top 100 Macisms and, you know, actions and thoughts that he's had because I haven't heard that one. So to have a supervisor to say that, because we live in such a political landscape in education, right. and sometimes people's ambitions get in the way of actually doing what's right for kids. Correct. That, um, Correct. There's, but there's, there's some really good people out there in education. Sometimes there's silence, but they'll, they'll they steady, you know, they're, they're great voices. The, so, the quiet people are always thinking. Yes. That's what I found. It's, it's not that they're quiet because they're just quiet. They're right. always thinking. They're thinking, they're listening to you and they're thinking about different ways that they could be better. It, yeah. um, don't discount the introvert. Do not discount the introvert because because I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm an introvert. Well, Artie, I never would have guessed. I do honestly. think that because I'm looking back in my career, and when I was at Rowan Salisbury, I think you guys did put on a presentation that was called "PE on a Shoestring Budget." For some reason, I have this visual of this right. hand drawn, like almost Converse shoe, and I remember Jim Rich. Wow, did he teach me everything about adaptive PE, by the way, too. I did go to a great university that groomed me for adaptive PE, but he really highlighted the laws and policies and the do's and the don'ts right. and um, how to write up an IEP for adaptive PE. Um, that I mean, that was just gold for me as a, as a young person, too, just starting out the career. But I remember the three of you, I do remember going on the floor, reflection on the floor reflection, almost like breaking it down. Why did we do this? Let's be reflective and talking us through the actions that really helped me understand classroom management and organization and flow of a plan. Right. plan. It was, it was yeah. Mac. It was totally Mac that said, this is where we want to have our audience, our, our teachers at the end of the first hour. If we don't have them here, at the end of the first hour, it just is not going to work. So we, we had certain goals or objectives, you know, where do we want them to be at the end of the first hour? Well, we want them engaged. Mm -hmm. We want them in a thoughtful process. We want it to be instructional, but we also wanted it to be a little bit reflective and critical of where they are. If you don't have an instructional physical education program, if you don't have enough equipment for every student, if you are just playing games, games of, and you fill in the blank, 
and there's not any skills being produced, then that's more like a recreational program than a physical education program. And so we wanted them to be able to tell themselves what the difference was. Right. It was very powerful, I, I believe. We were we yeah. were able to touch the lives of um, many. <laughs> yeah. Many. So that leads us to another question about all your workshops, presentations, conferences that you have led. You have organized Spring Fall Pelts, which stands for Physical Education Leadership Training, Camp Caesar, the right. PE Institute, right. uh, state conferences, um, and there's many more. But Artie, what are some of your fondest memories? Sure. I mean, I have no problem with this. I mean, because uh, I have them. So my one of my three top fondest memories was not a workshop I would I conducted at all. It was a workshop that was put on by Lee Allsbrook, L E E Allsbrook. He um, he was teaching in uh, Tennessee, and on a Saturday, all day Saturday, on the Duke University East Campus, he was brought in by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And he's an elementary PE teacher. He was so inspirational. There's so many things I learned from Lee, but this is the one that really, really impressed me. He did not get in front of the group. No one introduced him until like two minutes before nine. So at 8.30, we're all gathering. We're sitting in the bleachers. At 8.30, I'm sitting down, and this guy comes up to me. And we just start talking and then he leaves and he goes and talks to some other teacher. And then he, he was like working the crowd. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> the, guy the guy's running for mayor or some mayor of Durham. <laughs> and then Susan Johnson, who was the, uh, uh, physical education consultant, you know, two minutes to nine, she stands up and says, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm so grateful that you're here. I'd like to introduce uh, our presenter, Lee Osberg. Well, Lee stands up. Well, he's this is the guy that was introducing himself <laughs> and trying to make everyone else feel comfortable. And I'm thinking, wow, that's impressive because he knew it's all about relationships. So that's number one. So be like Lee. Okay. I wanted to be like Lee. Be relational. Uh, number two, number two was a story about Mac, a, a student teacher and an alcoholic. Okay. So, uh, and, and I don't think, I don't think Scott is going to mind. I, I'm sure he doesn't. So Scott Robinson, um, he's a native American from Oklahoma. He's attending Western Carolina university as a physical education major. He does a student teacher under Dennis Prophet at Fairview School in Silva, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Dennis was, uh, was the physical education teacher that followed Mac. Mac became the assistant principal. Dennis followed him. And you had Scott who was going through turmoil. And he said, you wouldn't have known by looking at me because I tend to have it together, but I was struggling. I was a fatherless, alcoholic, physical education major who had no idea what physical education was about. And it was through the loving kindness of Dennis Prophet, who set an example for him and Larry McDonald, who was the assistant principal, who always, at the end of almost every day, would sit down and talk with uh, Scott. It just totally changed the way that he thought about life. And so it's the impact. So that's number two. And then my last one is my last really big uh, incident or memory has to do with Al Canonical. Al Canonical started Camp Caesar. So this is up in West Virginia. Um, I was very fortunate that Mac 
and Jim brought me to Camp Caesar. I'm going through, it's at a 4-H camp. I'm driving through the, it takes like eight hours to drive from North Carolina to Camp Caesar. We're driving through the, uh, the doors, the gates, and I see this guy running around, scurrying from cabin to cabin to cabin to cabin. He has this, uh, he has a broomstick. He has a broomstick, and on the broomstick are these rolls of toilet paper, you know? You imagine a broom with eight stacks of toilet paper. <laughs> he's running around. He's putting these down, and he's making sure that all the toilets are working properly, making sure they have enough um, tissue. Turned out, that's Al Canonical. That's the, that's the organizer of this. He was just such hands-on, very... He wouldn't do anything without him doing it himself. He just... He, I don't know. Uh, that's why people loved him. And that's why he was able to get so much done for the great state of West Virginia. Those are my three memories. Those are just memories that also exemplify just good leadership. I right. about, you know, would a leader push the broom if they expect someone else to do it? Would a leader step in and generally care about somebody and lend a hand and an ear to listen to somebody who is going through turmoil? Right. So, you know, those are those true leadership. Like I'm so inspired by great leadership moves mm -hmm. that um, it's unfortunately some of them are rare stories, but when you have them, they are so impactful. Right. Yeah. Wow. It's important to have great leadership. I mean, you know, one of my favorite uh, principles, honestly, was a PE teacher, you know, ex PE teacher. And it's the kind of leader that at the end of a lesson or day, it wasn't, well, you did this wrong. It was, well, what do you think we could do to mm -hmm. have more engagement? These are right. my thoughts. This is how I did some things. I know things are a little different. You have maybe more equipment than I did, but that was a great leader. But then oftentimes, you know, the hard thing with our business is leadership doesn't understand PE and we have to educate them. Right. Like we do our students, you know? Right. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it brings me to to this question here is, you know, you've you've presented and a, a ton. You've led and organized trainings all over the U.S. and internationally. Um, and you always had a, the ability to bring in some of the best presenters and, and keynote speakers. Um, so can you tell us, I mean, how do you how do you have this eye for talent or, how, you know, how do you how do you go somewhere and see somebody and go, yeah, I need to have you at, say, the PE Institute, or we need you at NC Shape or Pelt right. or what? Yeah. It's looking for those folks that have it all together. So as an example, Joey Fight. Everyone mm -hmm. knows Joey. He's mm -hmm. a Canadian. He's a physical education teacher, has his own website, does phenomenal things. Joey was one of the very first people that understood curriculum alignment. Mm -hmm. He was able to identify what the what the taught, tested curriculum should look like. And uh, when you see those individuals, when you find those individuals, it's like a diamond in the rough. And for whatever reason, I've been fortunate enough to find people at the cutting edge. And it goes without saying that these people also include, you have Joey, you have mm -hmm. Nathan Horn, you mm -hmm. have Jared Robinson, here in the States, you have Ben Landers. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're just everywhere. It's just that I'm, I'm always, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm always worried. I'm <laughs> always worried about the next generation of leaders. And so my job as a, a leader, my job as a leader is to find the future leaders to um, put them in the spotlight have them have the time to build their customer base, their base of support, sure, and do their thing. And uh, I don't know why I do that, but it's just fun for me. It's fun for me to find the next, you know, Nathan Horn. Mm -hmm. Do you Ryan. worry about some of the leaders in burnout? Is that one of the things that you worry about to kind of mentor and be sure uh, that? You can will be taken advantage of or bite off too much they can chew? What are some of your worries? 
I'm, um, I've always been worried that um, as leaders grow old, like myself, and move on <laughs> to the happy hunting ground, that we won't have enough uh, won't have enough synergy to keep mm -hmm. it going. Because I've seen that happen. I've seen some terrific yeah. programs led by some very competent administrators, and once that situation uh, is gone then the program falters, goes into decline, and then eventually just disappears. You wouldn't know that, uh, that they had a great, terrific health and PE program because it's not there. That's a good, really good point about the synergy. I'm going to be thinking about that one on my run. Yeah. Do you think with, you know, I mean, we have this influx right now of technology and ways that we could actually reach out to each other, support each other, and right. share with each other a whole lot more than we ever have in our lives, you know, well before the internet, um, that, you know, part of that has become more of a competition and, and not so much a mentorship. Mm. Or... No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that it, it enhanced mm. our ability to share best practices, to share what's going on uh, as an elementary physical education teacher, you're the only person in that building, typically. Yeah. So you don't, you can't compare your program unless you see another teacher's program. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. So we need, we really need to visit other programs in addition to um, seeing them, like, uh, and listening uh, on the podcast and things like that. So, excuse me. Sure. No problem. Yeah, see, that's the thing. That's part of the reason we created this is – you know, um, was to get as many people on here to connect and get, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially you on here because you're one of those mentors to a lot of people, especially in the state of North Carolina. Forget everybody else. We're going to claim yeah. you as our own because you're here. <laughs> um, and, and we've seen all the awesome stuff that you've done for the state. And then, you know, it, it's it's getting that word out and, and, and keeping all this alive. Like, Listening to the stories, we could honestly probably sit and have 10 pizzas, several beverages, Coca-Cola or whatever, and, <laughs> I and, and just sit back. <laughs> yeah. And sit back and listen to you talk and Chip Candy talk mm -hmm. and, and right. you know, everybody we've mentioned so far. And it's just amazing. Well, well actually, he, yeah, that's what's happening right now where I am. You you mentioned that uh, I'm on vacation. I'm I'm at Holden Beach. Yeah. In a seven-bedroom <laughs> beach cottage with uh, six other PE couples, you yeah. know. So uh, and we and we shared. We had Jim and Mary Rich here. Uh, uh, Ron and Melanie Champion are here. Uh, Zaina Whitmire, Ann Whitmire, Cheryl Edwards. Uh, these are all. Gracie Bannerman, these are all phenomenal teachers. Yeah. And we sit and we laugh and we cry and mm -hmm. we uh, just have a phenomenal time. Well, Artie, you made me think about, you know, how you worry about the, the, the ones that are still in the business and the ones that are hopefully going to take the baton and run right with it right. and to keep that synergy. Well, we have a responsibility to fulfill that. Yeah. You know, so you putting right. that out there and th that sound bite, it really brings into where I say that we have to give back to a community that has given so much to us. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Our ambition is to be able to lift up the profession and keep that synergy just like you have and the connections. So um, that just is another pursuit and passion that just made me think about that's, that's our duty. Right, because we had it. I mean, yeah. they, that it's the baton being passed to the next generation. That that torch, that flame being passed to the next generation. So, yeah, we got we've got some great people that are that are you know like Kim Ballers and the Chris Walkers in our in our state sure. that are, right. are doing that are charging forward. You know, I, they, we everybody in our state, especially, have huge shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. so. right. You know, I mean, just just between you, Larry Mack and Jim Rich, I mean, those uh, 
it's going to take a lot of us to fill them shoes. Well, <laughs> even people that he mentioned that he's at the beach with, yeah, I, yeah. I have fond memories and going to right. sessions from, you know, Melanie Champion to Cheryl. I visited her school. Like I, throwing back those names, I'm like, yes, influenced me, influenced me, right. impact. So yeah. it, let's take the baton. Right. So our, <laughs> uh, we're, we're going to, well, it's it's a shared relay baton, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not an individual race. So the baton is passed through a, the efforts of a relay team. Yeah. Obviously, I'm, I'm a runner type person. I'm going to keep using those metaphors throughout my career. But part of your legacy, too, and giving back to the profession um, started where you published and Correct me if I'm wrong, but you started, was it called just great activities or was it something before that? Talk to sure. us about your publishing history. How did you get started, your drive, how difficult is it, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So in 1982, my wife Elizabeth and I started a publishing company, uh, but we didn't know it. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time. We thought we were just publishing a little newspaper. And it was called the Great Activities Newspaper, uh, 48 pages on newsprint. And it had a very <laughs> limited circulation for the first three years. We were able to maybe get it up to about 300 subscribers. But in year four, in year five, in year six, the word just spread. So eventually we had over 5,000 subscribers all across the United States. Wow. We had individuals that were submitting articles and games and activities and field day things. We would add the illustrations and we would sell it. And then some guy said, hey, can you publish this book? I said, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Just send me the manuscript. And it turned out to be a terrific book. So we went into the publishing business, selling books. Wow. And then we started doing workshops. People said, well, can you do a workshop? And so then we started hiring trainers. So we had Jim Rich and Larry McDonald, Cindy Bross, Joella mm. Marhoff, uh, Gene Blades, um, Vicki Worrell, and others. And we went up and down the East Coast across the Midwest, up and down the West Coast. We did workshops for two weeks in the fall, two weeks in the spring. I mean, it was phenomenal. So it was just the whole thing of publishing and books and stuff. And you still are. You have the um, How to Be an Outstanding PE Teacher. Right, yeah, we're how to doing be an that. Outstanding Health Educator. Right, we're doing that, and then we're coming out with a new publication. It'll be a digital publication, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, let me think if I remember what we're going to call it. It's uh, tentatively entitled the Elementary Physical Education Almanac, the Elementary Physical Education Almanac, a month-by-month -month idea guide for planning the best year ever. So oh, it'll, it'll be, cool. yeah, it'll be monthly ideas, activities, hol, you know, like Halloween. Thanks. I saw that post. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that'll be out in September, and we've been able to actually get an entire entire states. Uh, so the state organization for Arizona is purchasing it for all of its members. That's the awesome. state organization for West Virginia is purchasing it for all of its members because uh, we're hurting. The individual state AFERS shapes are hurting. Okay. Um, okay. And we need to give perks and other, um, if they're not incentives, well, we need, to, we need to enhance that membership so that they'll remain members. And so that's a way to do that. I like that idea of even for our school district, how to be an outstanding PE teacher that providing that even for a new teacher, um, you know, beginner teachers. Yeah. Right. I'm making a note of that because I know a lot of the people that submitted in that and I, I need to order that book. So yeah. I will. Um, it's online. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's a, it's a, 
It's an on-demand print company called Book Baby. Book okay. Baby. Book Baby. Google that. Yeah, it's called okay. Book Baby. So yeah, they, they, they print them on demand one by one. Oh, okay. That's neat. That's unique too. So you don't yeah. have inventory. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I could see you guys. I could picture you guys right now, that group that you have there at the beach writing a book right now, you know, memoirs <laughs> from the gym. Right. The, the shoelaces, the tears, and the joy yeah. of teaching so, PE. Right. <laughs> well, we He's going to that. He's going to say that to the group tonight around the bonfire or something. As the Cinco de Mayo festivities pick up. Oh, yeah, right. get better and better. Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. I mean, all those things. They're just um, physical education teachers are so creative. I mean, I'm just totally yeah. always impressed. Um, one of the teachers here actually is the most creative person I've ever met. And her name is Ann Whitmire. Uh She's phenomenal. I mean, if if you gave her a hundred dollar gift certificate for the dollar store, she could turn that all that stuff into a PE curriculum. I mean, she's just wow, she's phenomenal. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Teacher. Yeah. So, uh, Artie, so take you to the last question I have. Um, what do you think is the most challenging issue in helping PE currently? Um. I think it's being able to articulate what physical education is and what it's not. I think it's uh, sometimes I believe it's our inability to distinguish between what physical activity is versus physical education is. Uh, they're not the same. They overlap. And then in the area of health education, uh, we need to have more educators to take health education more seriously and um, and not to shy away from it. You know, there are some very sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. There are some very controversial topics that need to be addressed in a healthy way that uh, we just need a lot of support around that. And I'm so glad that we're having more skill-based health textbooks and skill-based health programs out there. They're mm -hmm. just vitally important. And it's also communicating that message to those who are prioritizing funding and allocating right. funding, making yeah. um, this big school district decisions and, you know, and understanding that um, right. because I think a lot of district leaders, and we've had this conversation before, they base their decisions sometimes on their experiences that they had in PE. Right. And so I asked Chip Candy one time, or Chip, Chip, I didn't ask, no, I did ask him this, but he gave me this advice that he asked, um, I always get the last name wrong, John Rady or Rady, Rady right guys? Rady. 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 Yeah. He goes, John, we have all this research on the brain. We have all these articles that say movement and physical education, physical activity makes a difference. Why? doesn't schools embrace it more? And John looks at Chip and goes, it's gonna take a generation. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa. And that's even Chip said, he goes, that really hit me. He goes, we have so much going for us and messaging and what skills-based health is, what physical education versus physical activity is. You Google search that, Shape America has a big document right. you know, highlighting the differences. But for our profession ourselves to articulate the difference and to be able to advocate and message that is, I think, really important. Right. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So, and we have a lot of this stuff going on, but we do have to articulate that message and sort of be assertive more and nudge. That's what I feel like I do in my district is I have to be assertive and nudge and sometimes have those difficult conversations that district leaders don't want to hear. Right. But I'm still going to say it whether they approve it or not. A lot of times I get turned down, right. but at least for the integrity of the profession needs to be said. Well, if you don't ask, you're never going to get what you don't ask for. That's right. It may take and three, four or five years, but I'm going to keep asking. True. And uh, speaking of Mac-isms, uh, one of the things that Mac uh, would always say uh, is a no is a maybe in disguise. So if you get no from your administrator, it's a potential maybe in disguise. I like that. Yeah. 
And go oh, back to go yeah. back to him or her next week and ask again. I will. So you yeah. really don't do that. It's just a maybe in disguise. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's great. All right, that was a heavy question. I think we need quick bites. You ready, Keith? I'm ready. Hit All right. The, uh, little music am I, here. Am I ready? Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, so no, drink, no, take ready. a drink of water. All right, this yeah. is the more you know light part of the uh, right. session. So let me just do a little promo video for Quick Bites. All right, Artie. So as hey. you mentioned know, from past podcasts, this is the point where we just throw out some random questions. Answer them any way you like, as quick as you like. Can you pass? Can you pass? <laughs> That's right. And then, hey, you know, if you want to come back to one, fine. If you want to elaborate, it's up to you. Kim doesn't even know these questions. And uh, she usually is as, you know, whoa, as the right. guests are. So right. we'll start with something easy. What's your favorite pizza topping? I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Your favorite pizza topping. Pepperoni and mushrooms and a few black olives. Pepperoni, mushrooms, black olives. Okay. I love it. All right. All right. Would you rather be a famous musician or a famous actor? Uh, musician. Hmm. Yep. All right. Is there a certain instrument that you may have played or, you know, or a certain, uh, certain uh, style of music you had in uh, mind there? Folk, guitar, guitar. Oh, okay. James Taylor, Joni Ooh. Mitchell. Yes. Lightfoot, that whole thing, you know. That was that was me. All right. Huh? Love it. When you're at the beach, so I'm sure there's some Jimmy Buffett playing, right? Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Buffett. Melanie likes Jimmy Buffett, I think. I could I be think wrong. We all do. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave my yeah. I'll leave my stuff out of that. <laughs> Would you rather be able to fly or teleport? Oh, that's a good one. I like that one, Keith. Uh, fly. I'd rather fly. Okay. Uh, if you could have dinner with one famous person. Abraham Lincoln would be my one favorite mm -hmm. person. I, I just think that he was uh, at a very critical juncture in the United okay. States history. The I want to ask him how he made his decisions. Uh, that was very, very difficult decisions. Sure. You have to go against the norm. All right, I'll go back to an easy one here. Pizza Hut or Papa John's? Pizza Hut. Actually, mm -hmm. I don't like either, but I yeah. have to pick what. Uh, my yeah. favorite pizza. Hey, when you come to Durham, it's Randy's Pizza. Okay. Randy's Pizza is the best pizza in Durham. Yeah. Yeah. And when you come to Charlotte, we'll take you to Sales Pizza. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah. My um, wife, Elizabeth, from Charlotte. Oh, okay, okay, so when COVID's over and we're more open, we're gonna we're gonna give you a tour of our schools, and we'll have right. Lorenzo with us too, that principal, and we'll 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 take you out to lunch and all that. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. So I have a couple more, and these are gonna get a little interesting. Okay. <laughs> Would you rather know all the languages or play all the instruments? I rather know all the languages. If I have the ability to speak. Mandarin, Russian, uh, Indonesian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. I mean, that that's a blessing. That's a gift to be able to be you know, multilingual, uh, which I'm not. I know a little bit of English <laughs> and a little, a little bit of uh, Spanish. That's about it. You know, but the, the, the other side of that is, you know, music also communicates across all languages. So if you can go up there with a whole mess of stuff and... Yeah, that's true. So now these last two are going to be uh, <laughs> very thought-provoking for both of you. Okay. Would you rather give up looks for intelligence or intelligence for looks? I, I, intelligence well, I'm, I'm is pretty. Intelligence is by far the sexiest thing anybody could have. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna follow Kim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, yeah, I'd rather be thought of as being um, bright, articulate, 
and able to understand things than look good. I mean, mm -hmm. looking good only lasts for so long. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> I think that when you're bright, yeah. intelligent, humorous, yeah. can carry on a conversation, that is so attractive. Fair enough. But there's a lot of people in this world that think looks, you know, it's it's the right. money maker right here, you know. Well, that's Look, true. That's true. As long as you we can have a conversation with pizza, that that's all I ask. That's that's, <laughs> that's a gift. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so the last one here. Would you rather have the mind of an astrophysicist or the muscles of an Olympic athlete? Ooh. Oh golly, that. Ooh. Um, I guess the mind again, um, but I, the reason I was hesitating, I mean, you know, you could be too smart for your own good. Sure. <laughs> and not That's being able to, to relate with people, uh, to people, but I'll, I'll take mind over that. Yeah. And muscles, Keith, when you said muscles, I'm thinking like bodybuilding, strength building, but I quickly went into just being Olympian. Yeah. You know, the training, the commitment, the dedication, the, the journey that it took. Like I saw a lot more than just the muscles. I saw more of a personality. Well, I mean, you look at the, you know, some of our gymnasts. I mean, they're not huge muscles, but they've got the strength of, you know, a lot of yeah, a, right. a lot of the big weight lifters. And then even right. the Michael Phelpses. Sure. But Keith, yeah. did you know that Artie was, did you, were you a, a gymnast? In, the I, party? In, a, in, a, in a former life, I was. <laughs> I I participated in gymnastics in high school and college. And way back when, I got I was fortunate enough to compete in the uh, national NCAA championship and on the rings. That was my event. Wow! But that was Kim. Don't don't be that <laughs> impressed. That was a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> A long time ago. So you posted some throwback pictures from um, spring and fall pelts. Do you yeah. have any of those throwback pictures of you on the rings? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. They're there somewhere. I'm, I, no. Elizabeth, where are they? <laughs> no, they're they're not. No. No, we didn't. We didn't. No, we didn't meet until after all that was. Uh, after my collegiate career was over, so. Did your collegiate career lead you, um, did it aid you and lead you into a PE uh, profession, to a career? Uh, well, it did in a way. I mean, when I, I went to Cal State LA, uh, okay. California State University in Los Angeles. So when I graduated from Cal State LA, uh, I wanted to be a gymnastics coach, like my coach. Uh, I had a terrific coach, his name was Gordy Maddox. Um, if you were older, I would say you'd probably remember him on the wild world of sports. He was the Olympic commentator for men and women's gymnastics, and he was constantly on the wide world of sports. Um, that was my gymnastics coach at Cal State LA. And I soon recognized the fact that as a teacher first, as a physical education teacher first, I can impact the lives of more individuals so I, I went from being a, a coach first mm -hmm. and a PE teacher second to being a PE teacher first and a coach second and that was a wise choice that opened up everything to me everything when I made that decision to put coaching second and teaching first and that is the soundbite that <laughs> it is, is <laughs> That is amazing. Like, I don't even want to talk anymore because that is just such a good closure because I'm willing to bet there's many of us like myself that first went into coaching, then teaching, and then all of a sudden, wait, teaching yeah. is my passion before coaching. Right. Yeah. Wow. They both have their positives. So, you know, they're both. They do. They I do. Love I love coaching. I love teaching. I love being able to teach the little kids. And then coach the high school kids later because I got the best of both worlds. I got the youngest kids, the most impressionable. And then I had the older kids, which are still impressionable, but they have their own little ways too. Right. Yeah. Well, Artie, thank you so much for coming on. Well, I want yeah, you to 
Enjoy Cinco de Mayo with your friends. Please tell everybody we said hello from. I will. I will, I will do that. I will do that. Y'all have a great week, and thanks again for doing this. Absolutely. You are, you are uh, such shining stars to our profession. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We have big shoes to fill, and we'll take that baton. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye, Artie. Okay. See ya. Bye. Take care. Bye. I have all these notes. <laughs> I couldn't write fast enough in my pen, the ink, uh, you know. You say that all the time. Well, but part I of it is right. Think about yeah. On my run today. Well, part of what we do, right, is on this podcast, I mean, we're thinking people are going to be listening and not watching. And I'm sitting here and I like to look at the, the people as they're giving their answers. Yeah. You know, because I feel like it's a little more personal that they see me paying attention versus writing. And, you know, and it's not that I don't want to write things down, but I'm trying to do it like on the side where I'm not distracting because yeah. you're you're getting all this good information. There's so much stuff in there. And then when you, you're asking the questions to your guests and you see their passion and their body language, you really mm -hmm. see it in their eyes and when they answered the questions. So my and I'll, I'll give a few ahas. Maybe I'll give two. Um, loved when he said that Jim, Artie, and Mac, they went and presented, and then how critical um, in a, you know, sure way, way, is that they really reflected on their trainings and say, okay, how can we make this better? What can we do? Poke holes in my presentation style. Um, tell me the things that I can improve on, where they were receptive of that feedback to one another in a brotherly manner to say this person cares enough to coach me better, to coach me up and to put together this package training that was so engaging. And I do remember going, this is before you started teaching Keith. This is when I first started my career at Rowan Salisbury schools. I remember a full day workshop that the three of them were there and visually I could see that hand drawn shoe for some reason. And you know, I have binders of packets that I'm going to back to see if I still have it because I kept packets like crazy in binders and I still have my binders. <laughs> now it's digital folders, but my, sure. it was binders back then. Um, and that was in 94 is when I started my teaching in 94. So I know they came to Rowan County. Um, when he said about kids, when he talked about kids, he just, his, he, he, his face, he just gleamed and just his passion is about kids. And just when he said they're sensitive, yet they're fragile. Correct. And I need to be the teacher they need me to be. And when he was a beginner teacher, he goes, I wasn't quite yet the teacher they needed me to be. It took me three or four years to be the teacher they needed. It wasn't. I want to be this teacher. It was more in the language of my kids, my students need to be this teacher. Right. It was about the kids, not about him. I wrote that down. That really, really got got me and and my thought process. And of course, giving back to the the the, the I have a sense of responsibility. I feel, and there's many of us that we want to make sure that we have that synergy. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have written down, you know, the fragile students because um, it, it does. It takes time. I mean, you can have even the best mentors in the world, but it, you really have to spend time with your students to and take the time to set up something little just to get to know them so that when they come in that door, they're not just getting somebody that's telling them to do exercise mm -hmm. and, you know, because not everybody loves PE and we, and we know that, right. But they don't have to love PE. They just have to love being in my class in terms of, because I'm, I'm, I'm a safe, cool person to be around and makes their learning engaging. Well, like we could say that some have more challenging times than sure. people sure. because they want to be there with you and the connection and correct. That's yes, where I'm getting that. Of course. Non-dominant, dominant hand. I cut, you know, all the physical literacy cues, but, um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not putting it out there correctly, but it's getting there. Yeah, I, That's right. Well, there's so many things spinning. I mean, in um, the reflecting after each session, I mean, 
the best teachers in this business are the reflective ones. If you can look back at your best lesson and still find that hole, because I'm sure there is something in there that you can say, it was awesome, but I think if I do this, it might be a little better. Because mm -hmm. that's where we always had that thing as elementary PE teachers, right? Monday kind of stunk because you were trying everything out. Tuesday, you fixed it. Wednesday, you, yeah. Almost there. I'm fine. good. And Thursday, Friday, boom, you're hitting stride. And then here yeah. we're back at Monday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Friday was like push button. I got it. Rock star. I know exactly what's going to be happening. You know, yeah. and, and another thing that he said that's that's true is, you know, being able to communicate and know the difference between a physical education program and a recreation program. That's that was I like that term that he used recreation program. You know, because it, it that is something that, you know, it's you know, if we're just teaching sports, you know, then it then it does become more of recreation. Yeah. You know, but you know, it, it, it changes with each level. I mean, we're looking at lifetime fitness. The good thing that we're doing now is our, our profession is growing. We're, we've, we've got some new technology we can bring into our gyms that, that wasn't there. I mean, <laughs> and, think. and collaborating across social media platforms. Yeah. I was one of those teachers that went out at Walmart at midnight. Cause I was so excited that Walmart was open 24 hours just to buy one CD that I had to play that song for the next day because I had an activity that would go along with that song. And I knew the power of music. So I'd be driving my Honda Civic going to buy that one CD. Now you just download it. <laughs> that, that's true. Oh. Was that one song, Cotton Eye Joe? Yeah. Yes, I did do that. <laughs> um, but an influencer that um, also made an impact on my career that I think Artie is at the beach with that um, talking about music. And I don't know if I told Artie this, but I was at the North Carolina State Convention one year, probably my second year of teaching, and I was in Don Puckett's presentation. Sure. Don Puckett was the one who first showed me the William Tell Overture. Yep. And he had all, you know, with you know, with the scarves and the bean bags and hidden, you know, all that stuff. And then a lot of line dances. Don Puckett had a VHS cassette of line dances. Okay. Now VHS. you know I love my dance unit, Keith, right? I know you did. I do. But I went up to Don at somewhere, maybe in the expo or whatever he was standing. And I go, I love your music. I want that music. And he goes, come here. And he went underneath the table and he gave me a cassette tape of all the music that he played in that session. And I just looked at him like, wait, you're giving this to me? He goes, yeah. So do something good with it. Go do it. I played that cassette tape before CDs came out, like all the time. Right. It was like the thing. Like I'll never forget that gift of generosity that Don Puckett um, handed to me. It was, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so. Good old cassette tapes. But, you know, I tell you, it's, it's, it's hard to not listen to Artie talk about his relationship with, with Jim and Mac and not think of the three of us. You know, because um, we uh, we argue, we fight, we collaborate, but we also know that it's for the better. Mm -hmm. We don't always agree, but goodness gracious. I mean, this is, you know, we're a trio similar to that trio. And that's going to be us one day sitting on that. At Holden uh, Beach. <laughs> you know. Well, like I've already shared with you and Andrew, there's there's something bigger than just the three of us. Sure. Right. And just giving there's something bigger and we have a sense of responsibility and you have a sense of responsibility to hold me accountable to it. And I have a sense of responsibility to make you hold holding accountable. And we're also, you know, like I always say to you, like poke holes in my delivery style. Tell me everything that I need to give feedback on. I know you're not criticizing me because you're coaching me up. So with that being said, um, I'm going to go for a run and think about all this. Um, this is a great great podcast. This is, there's a lot of stories that Artie can share with us and will share with us, you know, more in the future, but we are so grateful to have him on. Yeah. And I awesome. myself with the stories. He's a storyteller. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's the thing we're learning more and more about the people that we do is yes. they all have stories and storytelling is our business. Yes. He's, a, he's really good at it. He's I can't really wait for people to hear this episode tomorrow. I know. 
All right, Keith. Or this week, whenever it goes out. Let me put the outro video on. Well, don't forget your last piece of pizza. Or are you already done? Slice you later. Oh. <laughs>